we are not excited at all to have you here. There's zero excitement. So um, we start off every Lesbians Who Tech event off with a high five. And we've been using this photo a lot. And I gotta be honest, I have jealousy. I have jealousy of this photo, a lot of uh, FOMO. So I just, can we redo it? Can we redo the, like a little look? <laughs> Felt as good as I well, thought it was gonna thanks feel. For the, <laughs> thank, thanks for the Rodham Rye, too. Yeah. I know many of you know my, my wife owns a distillery. You're welcome for future things. Um, and she made this Rodham Rye. So we've got, we've got all the beverages here, so we're good for a while. We can stay as, as long as we want. So did you, did you know you were a lesbian icon? I mean, it's basically like RBG, <laughs> you. And I, I just want to say, you're more to us than just the pantsuits. Well, I, 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 I am thrilled to hear that. I mean, um, and, and, you know, I don't want to give short shrift to the pantsuits. Um, <laughs> well, because, okay, just, you know, I rarely do this, but I have to tell you, if you don't know already, that I, I am on People Magazine's best dressed list this year. Yes, yes. Now, granted, it's in the 70 plus category, but no. whatever. Speaking of icons, um, uh, a couple days ago was the anniversary of Edie Windsor passing away, and she's one of our heroes. Um, we named our coding scholarship after her, and uh, you did the eulogy for her. I was there, it was beautiful. I'd love to hear more just about your relationship with her, how you met her. How many people here ever actually got to meet Edie Windsor? <laughs> the, the thing about, about Edie, talk about icons, um, she didn't set out to be an icon. She just was living her life and doing it the way she wanted to do it. And when her longtime partner died and she realized that she was not going to be treated fairly, let alone equally, um, by the government, you know, she launched this campaign uh, with her lawsuit. And every time that I was around her, I just could feel this strength, this, this absolute determination that she had. And when, she, when her case went all the way to the Supreme Court, there's some great scenes of her um, on the outside of the court when the case was uh, obviously argued, and then when uh, the case was decided uh, in her favor. So I was so honored to speak at um, her, memorial service uh, because she is one of those people who changed the world and did it in a way that not only uh, benefited um, people like her who were in relationships at that time, but helped to pave the way for everything that has come since. Uh, I think you, can, you, you have to put Edie into the line of people who made the changes that led to marriage and that we're still fighting about, but which she was never doubtful were going to happen. And she was an engineer. So we get to claim her both. Um, and we actually, we have her wife here, Judith, over here today too. So we love you, Judith. Um, you... You've said that you love making lists. We do too, we're a big, uh, we're into lists. Um, and we just wanna know what's on, what's on your list today. Um, obviously, now that you've come here, you can cross off Lesbian 2 tack from your bucket list, but outside of that, what's on your to-do list? You know, winning the midterm elections and making sure that, um, that everybody votes. I mean, I shouldn't have to say this to this crowd because you guys are on the front lines of change. I mean, really making the future. But we have got to win both, um, at least one, preferably both houses of Congress. And we can't do that if people don't show up and vote. And it's been great that we've had so many people involved. So this new organization I started called Onward Together, we've been supporting candidates and we've been supporting groups that recruit candidates and train candidates and campaign for candidates. So I'm doing other things, a paperback of my book. I was just telling uh, Kara 
Swisher, who's here in that, you know, that was not flannel, that was cashmere that she had on. Just, <laughs> Both, just but so we'll you know. Later. But um, I, I looked at the label just because I'd never seen anything quite like it. Um, so, uh, I, 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 I told her, you know, some of you might remember that she interviewed me two years ago, the spring of 2017, and it was a great interview, it was tough, as she always is, but during it, I said things like, you know, the Russians were more involved and all of that, and people were like, oh, she's lost it, crazy. So my paperback comes out Tuesday with you know, some more information and an afterword. Um, so my goal is to do everything I personally can do and to inspire you to do to elect Democrats and then to make sure it's not stolen and undermined because we have a tremendous group of candidates, really terrific people. I've been doing fundraisers, especially for young women running for Congress, um, but it won't matter if we don't vote. So when you ask me, that's, there's only one thing on my bucket list right now, do everything I can do to help us uh, save our country. Sorry. Speaking, speaking of uh, the election, in a book, um, Dear Madam President, an open letter to women who will run the world, uh, written by one of your former staffer, staffers, Jennifer Palmieri, uh, she said, Donald Trump in the 2016 election is the disruption that came to politics to prove to us it is entirely broken. Do you think that's true? Look, I think, I think Jen, who has a wealth of experience in politics, um, wrote an amazing book, uh, the Dear Madam President book. And in it, it's very personal about her experience in my campaign, but also how surprising it was that someone who was as not only disruptive, that, that's not fair, because disruption is sometimes really positive, and I don't think that he was or is, uh, but someone who came to a presidential election um, and engaged in behavior that we had never seen before and has given unfortunate support to people who um, are now feeling much freer to be uh, biased in all kinds of ways, whether it's uh, racist or misogynistic or homophobic or Islamophobic or xenophobic, whatever it might be. So disruptive maybe, but it was more, uh, to my, uh, to my mind, um, just unleashing a lot of the worst impulses, feelings, attitudes, biases um, that have never gone away, but which we have tried to contain, and he just you know, pulled the top off uh, of the Pandora's box. So yeah, it's been disruptive, but- More than that. More than that. Yeah, absolutely. So you wrote a book called What Happened, and I'm just curious how you picked the title and more specifically, how you chose not to have any punctuation. There's no period, there's no question mark, it's just what happened. Yeah. Well, that was, that, look, when I, when, um, that was good, I like that. When I, um, you know, when I was trying to make sense of the election, which was very hard to do, um, I kept thinking, I have all these questions, I don't know what happened. Um, so I, I needed to try to figure that out, and I, uh, my publisher said, oh, you know, write another book, and I said, look, the only book I want to write right now is try to figure out what happened in the election, and I think everybody was a little dubious because how are you going to find out, how do you do it without sounding sour grapes and all of that, but I was just obsessed with it because I couldn't figure it out, and so then I dove into it, and the information that was becoming more available. Some of it was around during the election, but not given any uh, particular uh, attention or importance. So once I got into it and I you know, finished a first draft in a kind of you know, red hot uh, frenzy, um, and they read it and they said, oh my gosh, you know, that, that could actually be published. Um, so <laughs> I... Uh, when I, so as I was getting toward the end, because I wrote it in like six months, I said, what am I gonna call it? And we had a lot of conversations about it and everybody kept saying to me, well, you know, you're really writing about what happened. And I said, yeah, and I think I know what happened. So yeah, no punctuation, I think I no question that. mark particularly. I don't think you need it. I don't think you need it. Um, well, I just wanna say, 
I listened to the interview with Kara, and I did not think you were crazy and um, about the Russia uh, part of the election. And for me, after the election, you know, I was really frustrated that it didn't get more attention. And so, and then I realized that um, on October 7th, which is one of the most uh, insane days we've probably ever had in our political history, it actually did get met mentioned. Obama had a press conference that day, October 7th, um, you know, stating that Russian, they had information that they were interfering with the election. It was the same day that Access Hollywood came out. There was a hurricane. It was the same day the Podesta emails. And I'm just so curious, how was that day for you? <laughs> We're all uh, yeah, well, hugging at the just, same time. Just as you would probably imagine. Um, you're right. I mean, the Obama administration that morning came out uh, with the director of national intelligence and the director of the CIA, who basically said the Russians are interfering in the election. Uh, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't reveal everything they knew because it was, you know, highly classified and all that. But they did lay it out there. But literally, I don't think it was in the news cycle for an hour. Uh, before the Hollywood Access tapes came out. Um, and everybody thought, oh my gosh, you know, that's, that's the end, that's the end. And then the Russians, through their cutout of WikiLeaks, which, as I've said before, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Russian intelligence now, unfortunately, didn't start out that way, but that's where it is today, uh, they dumped all these emails, and not only dumped them, but weaponized them. You know, they had a series of um, uh, stories that they were making up uh, using the emails in order to discredit me and, and obviously sow confusion. Um, so all of that happened within eight hours and it, it just made your head spin because uh, one thing would be enough. But what I, what I learned um, this time in this election uh, was how hard it was when you flood the zone to cover it. I've talked to so many reporters since who had a hard time making sense of the election and then initially had a hard time making sense of the administration and they just are drinking from fire hoses all the time. And when you add what the what the main, so-called mainstream media is trying to cover with everything that is online, much of it still being promoted by uh, the Russians, you know, it's really difficult for people to sort it out. So that day was just a, you know, a headbanger. You just couldn't believe what was happening and that you couldn't get through um, to have one story, like the Russians are invading uh, our electoral system. Stick with that for at least, you know, 48, 72 hours, but it was really hard. Do you regret not focusing on it more now? Yeah, you know, we, I, I regret that we couldn't figure out how to break through either. Um, you know, we started in the summer uh, of 2016, and particularly around our convention, uh, talking to anybody that we could talk to, my staff did, to point out the connection between, you know, the Russians stealing the DNC emails and then weaponizing those and dropping those and, and everything that we knew up until then. And in the late summer, um, it was clear more was going on. I wasn't privy to it, but I could tell because there were public statements by certain Democratic members of Congress that basically uh, alluded to a lot more happening than we were even aware of, but you couldn't pin it down. And so our efforts to try to persuade the press to dive in were not successful. And we, you know, we weren't able either to do a good job in discrediting the flood of um, emails that came uh, in October. I mean, they were absurd on their face, like, you know, we're running a, a child a pedophile ring in the basement of a pizzeria in Washington. I mean, who makes that stuff up? But it was, it was very, um, very much in the news, and it was pushed. And, you know, you say, well, look, the pizzeria doesn't even have a basement. I mean, there's no... There's a lot of, there's a lot there of are, fake news happening yeah, here. There's no, there no facts here. Um, but what the Russians understood and what uh, Trump's campaign and the Republicans understood is if they targeted those stories to certain people, they had a good chance of a percentage, and they didn't need much, as we know, a percentage believing stories like that. And so it was, uh, it, it was a hard, a hard uh, couple of weeks. So we're 53 days away from the midterms. How do we make sure, I mean, 
A, do you think this is happening now? And B, how do we stop it from happening if it is in the future? Well, what we know is even the intelligence officials working in the Trump administration went to the White House briefing room about a month ago and said it is happening still. The Russians are now clearly in our electoral systems, but we don't have a, we don't have a good um, strategy to combat them. Uh, in some states that are controlled by the other party, I think they believe that it's to their benefit, so they're not going to uh, really go into a deep uh, investigation. The Democrats, oh, actually it was bipartisan, an effort to try to do more to protect these upcoming elections, which was voted down. So every, every possible approach to try to protect us from whatever it is they're doing, and there are many different ideas about that, um, are being you know, stymied. Um, so the, the best way to deal with it is to just overwhelm uh, with numbers um, so that they can't shave them on the margins, they can't suppress their way to a victory by preventing people, uh, young people, minorities, older people from voting. So I, I think that we've got to do everything we can, but we still don't know what exactly um, the Russians and their allies um, are planning this time. So we have more women, people of color, LGBTQ people running for office. Obviously after the election, people were angry and there's been this catalyzation of uh, movement towards change. Obviously you were a huge part of that, starting that, um, the beginning really, I think of the resistance that we're in today. How does that feel to know that what happened in the election um, resulted in this type of movement and how are we gonna sustain that energy? It feels great. I mean, really, to see this uh, outpouring of predominantly young people and overwhelmingly uh, women, uh, LGBTQ, people who are just not gonna sit back and take it. They are out on the front lines, they're in the arena. It, it feels so right. It feels so good to see this kind of positive response, that people aren't lapsing into cynicism, they're not being so discouraged and depressed, although certainly a lot of us were for a while after the election, but now they are being fair, fueled. Fair, totally fair. Yes, they're being fueled to uh, try to get their voices heard. And I've been doing some events for some of these young, uh, exciting candidates, um, mostly young women, uh, and I think we have so much energy on our side, and what we've got to do is sustain that through the election, but then we have to build it into the political system. I mean, one of our problems is that the other side has been building infrastructure, um, a whole ecosystem, really, of organizations uh, that fund people, that are organized to send judges to be confirmed. They've been you know, working on that for decades, who are on the forefront of changing laws at the state level. They have been building their infrastructure for 30, 40 years, and we have not been as uh, focused. We go from campaign to campaign, and there's that old saying about campaigns and candidates that you know Democrats like to fall in love and Republicans just fall in line. And there's a lot of truth. We to need that. to do both. We, we need, need to, to do, do both. both. We need I to. Mean, and, and, but we also need to understand that politics is not just about candidates and elections. You need to have a system in place that no matter who runs, no matter you know, what year it is, you can support those people. And I, I really want to do a big shout out to the tech community because a lot of uh, people after the election in 2016 you know, looked up and they said, we can do better, we can do better polling, we can do better um, you know, voter protection, campaign protection. So I've been working with and supporting some of those groups as well, because we were being, uh, frankly, outmanned, outwomaned um, on the other side, because they had a system that they basically imposed. I'll give you one last thing, because I'm pretty you know, uh, concerned about this. So, Republican candidates are told to spend 40% of their uh, advertising budget on digital. Makes sense, right? Democrats are not told that. So on average, Republicans are told to spend 40%. Democrats spend between zero and 15%. 
Now, this is changing thanks to a lot of people like you um, who have been speaking out, working with campaigns. I, I am supporting uh, Tech for Campaigns, which is a uh, really important piece of this. Uh, because that's what they found, that you know, there just wasn't an understanding or a commitment to using digital. And so we're, you know, we're, we were behind, and we're, we're playing catch up. But after the election, once you know, we catch our breath and we're so happy that we were successful, we've got to go to work on the next one. I mean, you, the other side never quits, and they have cadres of people who are focused on the next election, and we've got to do the same. Well, I just want to say we're in, right? We're in? We're in for that? <laughs> So, so speaking of tech, um, there's a diversity problem in technology. Um, the tech sector as a whole has spent over a billion dollars on trying to solve this problem uh, for more women, uh, for more black and Latinx people in technology. If you were a tech CEO, how would you solve this problem? I'm so glad you asked that because... Wait, you want to be a tech CEO? You know, I maybe. Mean, we, can, um, we can go with that. Yeah, maybe, right? Uh, look, I, I think... It, it's one of the um, obligations that I think that the tech community and the, especially the big tech companies have. And I think they, have, they should have a three-part strategy. I think a lot of tech money should be going into schools uh, to introduce kids who would otherwise be excluded uh, to the opportunities that are in the tech world and helping to train them and not only in the classroom, but after school programs. There is so much that the tech community could do. There is so much money that could be used to really start building and filling a pipeline. There are on-off and, and occasional uh, programs that are undertaken, but there's nothing like the sustained effort that is needed. Secondly, I think that the tech community should be going into underserved communities and Absolutely. training people. I, I, I truly believe that there is a big opportunity out there for people, if they were given the training and the support, uh, to be part of uh, the future when it comes to tech. I also think that there needs to be schools or training centers attached to every single tech company that employs you know, more than 100 people so that they can do more on in-house training and outreach and training and job placement. This is, this is not complicated. It just requires a commitment from the people who have the resources to do it. I think one of the things um, that we have to fix is that there's clearly a double standard for women. The more uh, powerful you are, the more you are disliked. We just saw that in the um, US Open finals, um, uh, sexism and racism there. And uh, I just want to hear from you. Obviously, you've experienced this a lot, probably more than anyone in the world. Um, how are we going to solve this double standard? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you said you could stay. Oh, longer, yeah. Right? Look. Um, well, part, part of the, the challenge is for women to support women who challenge the double standard. The double standard is alive and well. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, in my experience, there are a couple of reasons why women are put down or judged unfairly and harshly. Uh, one is because they pose a threat. Uh, they pose a threat to the established order, they pose a threat inside a company or in politics or academia, wherever they might find themselves. And so the uh, knee-jerk reaction is to put them down and put them down personally, not necessarily professionally first. Um, and so every woman has an interest in calling that out. You know, if you're going to object to somebody's work, then be specific. But don't go into this like, well, you know, she's just not likable. Well, I have a list of about 10 million men who are not particularly likable. And That's right. Um, and, but, but, the, but the knee jerk plays into all of these cultural stereotypes. And so people say, oh, I don't know if I want to speak out because, you know, she can be kind of angry or she can be kind of pushy or whatever she might be. Um, so, but we've got to get over that. We've got to support each other and we've got to speak out for each other. And then 
The second thing I would say is this whole question about women standing up for ourselves, and you mentioned the US Open. Um, you know, I've watched tennis for decades, and I've seen a lot of men throw their rackets. I've seen them scream at the uh, referees. I've seen them, you know, engage in all kinds of, you know, angry, hurt, disappointing uh, behavior. But everybody understood it was because they were such great competitors. You know, they were in the moment. They couldn't help it. Well, and along comes Serena, who is standing up for herself and speaking out and being basically put down uh, and penalized. And I, you know, I think that it doesn't matter um, if you're out there by yourself and you're trying to do it, uh, you, you know you're taking risks. And yet the only way we're going to expose the double standard and hopefully eventually see it end is if we're willing to do that. And if we hope and, and count on other women um, standing uh, behind us. So I'm gonna keep you know, doing what I can, but I hope everybody does the same. We're in for that too, we're in for that too. Um, all right, quick, quick rapid fire. Oh, rapid fire. Team, okay. this, is, this is probably the most important question you have here today. Team dog or team cat? Dog. Yes, that's right. That's right. Do you own Bitcoin, yes or no? No. Opportunity there, people. Um, do you think Facebook is a utility? Do you think Facebook is a utility? Well, you can answer longer. As I, as I remember from Kara's last long interview, um, originally Mark thought it was, um, and I don't. I don't know the best way to sort of work with the tech companies to figure out how to deal with all of these um, effects, second, third order effects on our democracy, on our social life, on our brains, but. Whether it's a utility or not, we're gonna to have to figure out uh, how to deal with it. Pantsuit or tracksuit? Pantsuit. I know, that was easy, that was easy. Crocs, Crocs or Birkenstocks? Birkenstocks. <laughs> Favorite female character on TV? Right now, Madam Secretary. I mean, that was, yeah. Most used app on your phone? Most used app on your phone? Oh, I, I hate to confess this, all the news sites. Yeah. yeah. I know, I can't help myself. What's uh, one TV film on your Netflix queue that's coming up? Oh, co you know, coming up, I don't know, I'm so far behind. Um, you know, I, I, I am so far behind. I, you know, I haven't even seen um, the second year of, of Handmaid's Tale or... <laughs> Of the crown, that you're going to need you an this right here for that. You're going to need this bourbon for my whole, uh, uh, my whole uh, viewing uh, uh, range. What is your biggest tech challenge? And by that I mean I'm around the same generation as Chelsea, and uh, my dad calls me a lot, probably every couple weeks, to solve something on his computer, his phone. He saves the list for when I see him. What do you call Chelsea to solve uh, any tech prop tech problems for? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Safe space, safe yeah, space. Yeah, you know, uh, my daughter, my son-in-law, my staff are extremely patient with me. Um, <laughs> you know, look, I, I, I was not an early adapter. Um, and, you know, I, I've come a long way. So <laughs> I, I, I like to think of the That's fact, your next book, maybe, yeah, is how you've yeah, become more... How I've, be, how I've yeah. become, you know, more of a, a, tech, I'm technical. a tech appreciator. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, they have to help me all the time because I'm always uh, asking questions, uh, like just, you know, just this week, and, and you know, I'm a little paranoid, to be honest now, so, um, <laughs> so when they call, I can sort of, sort of hear their eyes rolling, like, oh, you know, some of my messages are disappearing. <laughs> What's going on? Um, so so in, in tech, we like to have moonshots, right? What is, what is that one thing, if that happened, you would know your work is done? For me, it is having a black lesbian president. I will feel. And so for you, what is your, what is your moonshot? Wow. Oh, well, I got, can I have two moonshots? You can have oh, whatever okay. you want, Hillary. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, three. You know, obviously, 
one of them is having a woman president, which I think would make such a difference um, for, for our country and for, for little girls. Um, and the other is, once and for all, uh, getting to universal health care coverage that covers everybody. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to help make the first happen, and I'm going to keep working to make the second happen. So we just want to thank you so much, um, and we want to officially invite you to be part of our squad. So we got you your own hoodie. And I just want to say we are with you. We are with you all the way. Take a little. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.